Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, we're going to read verses 36 through 40. And these are not lengthy verses. I think we'll just read them in unison as we did this morning, all right? We won't alternate reading. We'll just read them all together, 36 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, and as we usually do, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse number 36. Ready? Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing now, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music tonight. It has blessed our soul, and Lord, we trust it's been a a blessing to you as well, and that, Lord, we have sung uh, with melody in our heart unto you. And, Lord, we're asking you now that you'll bless this special as uh, we continue to ask you to make our hearts ready to receive your word this evening. Lord, we want to, we want our heart to be in tune with your heart. We want you to have the, the mind that was in Christ to be in our mind so we can uh, understand and we can hear and listen to the Spirit of God tonight speak to each of us. And so help us to focus and help the special to do that for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Bethlehem Calvary, all of that town. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. There on the cross where he died for my sin. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Giving his life a poor wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost wonderful glorious oh what a savior is mine rising again in his infinite grace oh what a savior is mine shedding upon me the light of his face. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Lifting my burdens, relieving my care. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Giving me courage, to do and to dare. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. 
uttermost. Oh, it wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Sing that chorus with me, would you? Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, wonderful, glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Amen. Wow, that's good, isn't it? I could take a whole lot of that. That's wonderful. Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful Savior we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us and for being willing to send your only begotten Son to be the sacrifice for our sins so we could gather together on a Sunday evening in May 2018, and sing, Oh, what a Savior is mine. We love you this evening, and I pray that you will minister to each of us tonight as we open up your word. We, we believe, Lord, tonight that we're looking into a book that is not just the words of men or the words of a man. We truly believe these are the words of God. And Lord, we believe this book is alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We believe it will minister and speak to our heart, and we ask you to make it so tonight. Help us to listen carefully. Help us to listen mixed with faith that it might profit those of us who are listening. Lord, we desire to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so have your way in each one of our hearts and lives, and help me as I bring the message to be clear and understandable. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> the rich ruler here came, or a lawyer actually, and uh, he came to ask Jesus the great question, what's the greatest commandment? And of course, not too many weeks ago, we talked about that loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And again, that is, that is our outer man. That is not the inner man. You will love God with your spirit. That's what the spirit is for. It's the, the, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's that our spirit of man, man is a spirit, soul, and body, and it's our spirit that communicates with God. Our spirit will love God. That's not the issue. The issue is, will our mind, our soul, and our heart love God? Uh, that's our outer man. Okay, And God says, now once that is set, there's a second commandment. And it's like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, these are the two great commandments. As I said this morning, you'll never get number two right if you don't have number one right. The problem we're having in America when people don't understand how can people treat each other that way, how can we not love one another, and the words of uh, Rodney King from 25 years ago, can't we all just get along? The reason is, if you don't love God, you're not going to love your neighbor. Uh, you're not going to love him as you ought to. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And if we don't love God with all our mind and all our soul and all our heart, then we won't love others because, listen, at the root of it all, we are very, very selfish people. Okay? Don't, don't, come to the, don't come to the pastor and say, I'm really struggling with pride. You know why? Everybody struggles with pride. We are proud people. It's in our sin nature. And so the, the reason most people won't get saved is they're proud. And they're stubborn. And they want to do it their way, not God's way. Uh, you're not sure how selfish you are, let me ask you a question. When you see a group picture, you're in a group picture, who do you look for first? Hmm? The New York Telephone Company studied the most often used word 
they monitored 500 phone calls, and the most often used word used 3,900 times, I. I, I, I. We think about our own affairs, we think about what we want to do, we think about what we're going to say, and the truth is, you can, you can become interested in others, and if you'll make it more of a priority that you want to be interested in what others think and what others are doing, you can make more friends in two months than you will in two years trying to get everybody else to be interested in what you think and what you're doing. Now, Jesus told us that we are to love others as ourself. He told us that we're to think of others and not ourselves. Philippians 2.4, look, every man not on his own things, but every man on the things of others. We're to put others ahead of ourselves, and Jesus was a supreme example of that. I want to break others down into three groups that we have to love. All right, The very first group that God says we have to love, if we're going to love our neighbor as ourself, is we have to love our foes, our enemies, if you will. And that seems like it may be the most difficult one. Uh, to handle, because but we have to understand what love means. We understand love is not just a a warm fuzzy for them. All right, they oh, I'm in love. I get goosebumps. That isn't what love means in the Bible. Uh, love is an action. Love is an act of our will. Uh, Hollywood and the world would have us think love is only an emotion. And don't don't get me wrong. Love is not in the absence of emotion either. There certainly can be passion and emotion in love, but that's not what fuels it. What fuels love, God didn't so love the world that He felt warm fuzzies for us. Or He got goosebumps for us, okay? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why did He do that? Because that's what we needed. We needed a Savior. We needed the sacrificial Lamb of God. And God provided that for us as a payment for our sin. So we would not have to die and go to hell. So love is when we willingly, sacrificially give of ourselves for someone else with no thought of return. With no no thought of what's coming back for me. And so the same thing is true when I love my neighbor. I'm going to willingly, sacrificially give myself for them with no thought of return. And that means I'll love my enemy that way. That's why Jesus said, if your enemy's hungry, what should you do? Yeah, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, what should you do? Why, that's what he needs. If he's naked, clothe him. See, he's saying you'll, you'll do that and you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. And that, that's not talking about judgment, by the way. But it is, it, it does, the rest of that verse, don't miss it. It says, and the Lord shall reward thee. See? We're not, we're not doing it for what they can do for us. Well, I helped them once, they never did anything. Or I, I did something for them, and look, you don't even know where they are now. We've all been in those situations. I was reading and preparing for this message, and someone said, why do you think Muslims hate America so? It's because we conquered one of their countries, and yet we treat them with civility and compassion. You ever think about that? Normally when someone, when, when people, when they conquer a country, they are not real nice to the people who used to live there. In fact, in some cases, in, in Bible days, they completely wiped out the people who lived there. We don't do that. Where did we learn to do that? Where did Americans learn to do that? We learned that from the Bible. When we, in 1940s, when we dropped those bombs on Japan, It wasn't long after that, General Douglas MacArthur was calling for, I think, 10,000 missionaries to come to Japan. He didn't get it. Or if he he had back then, we might not need missionaries to Japan. Japan might be a whole different nation than what it is now. But why does America care about sending missionaries there? Didn't you just drop bombs on them? Yeah, but what makes us... Try to love those who hated us. God's Word does. The foundation upon which our country was built. 
You see, to the world, that may be a weakness, but according to God's Word, it's a strength. And it's a blessing. The Bible says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 17-21, He said, Beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy... It's all in the context of your enemy. Don't you take vengeance into your hands. Yeah, well, I'll show them. No, you won't. Yeah, well, I don't get mad, I get even. No, you don't. That's God's department. That's not your department, that's not my department. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When you can show compassion to others, when you feel angry, and you don't give in to how you feel, you obey the Spirit and how He says, God says you should treat them, you are on your way to spiritual maturity. Because you're not doing what you want, you're doing what God wants. You show me someone who's, who, who, who's given to fits of rage and temper. And I can show you a person who is given to the lusts of the flesh. Boy, that's quiet, isn't it? Huh? Oh, me. You see, anger is a work of the flesh. Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children. In fact, look at that, would you? Go to Matthew 5. You're in Matthew 22. Just go to your left in Matthew 5. Why don't you look at it and lay your eyeballs on it, will you? Matthew 5, not literally, of course, but. <laughs> Jesus said in verse 43, You've heard it say, you, had, you have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the just and on the unjust, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust, on the evil and the good, rather. For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? If you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Jesus is saying what's going to set you apart, what's going to show everyone that you're followers of Jesus Christ is you won't just love people that love you, you're going to love people who will hate you. You'll love your enemy. That's a, that's a tall order, and I don't know about you. We can't do that in the flesh. You have to do that in the, in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is, what's the very first one? Wow. Well, the very first indication that you're living a life yielded to the Spirit of God is love. Love God and love others. And first of all, you'll love even those who would be your enemy. When you're loving your enemy, you're, you're coming you're coming closer to spiritually, spiritual maturity and spiritual perfection in Christ. So why would you say that? Notice what he said. He, in this passage, now remember, he's talking about loving your enemies and being good to them who aren't good to you. And he says, If you salute your brethren in verse 47, what do you more than others? Do not the publicans the same. What's verse 48 say? But be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's being mature in Christ. You're on your way to maturity when you love your enemies. There's a second group I want to talk about tonight that we love, and that is our fellow man. When God says you love your neighbors yourself, it includes our enemies. 
but it also includes our fellow man. Jesus, if you turn to Matthew 9, you're in Matthew 5, just turn a few pages over to Matthew 9. And of course, just talking about mankind in general. And notice what Jesus says in Matthew 9 and verse 36, when He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith He unto His disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. What's the problem? The laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. That's what Jesus is saying when we, when we think about loving others and loving mankind. It's really interesting. He, he always puts it in the context that the best way to love them is to give them the gospel. I'm for, I'm for you know, missionaries who... Uh, go and, you know, they want to teach people. Uh, we have Brother Martin, uh, Doc Martin, who does medical care, and, and I'm, I'm for medical missions. I'm for medical missions like they do it. They give medical missions, and then they have a presentation of the gospel. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not interested in making somebody full or teaching them how to, uh, you know, uh, plant things or grow things and give them good water and, and fix them up physically and let them die and go to hell. What, what is that going to help them? Not, I'm not opposed to the one. I'm not saying you have to do one or the other, but let's not neglect the most important thing. I want them to have the gospel. And that's where Jesus sets the example. And he said here, it's interesting, isn't it? Did you notice what we're praying for is not for the lost, we're praying for the laborer. God says, pray that the laborers will go. When you pray for lost people, when you see that list on Wednesday night of those with lost loved ones, don't just pray for the lost loved ones. Pray for laborers to go witness to them. Folks who they'll listen to and folks who'll be bold enough to give the gospel to them so they can be saved. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And once Christ has saved us, we, we talked about the woman at the well this morning in Sunday school. Man, once she knew that it was Christ and once she knew that she received Him as her Savior, what was her first thought? Man, I'm going to go tell somebody about this. She left the water pot and ran back to the city and said, Come on, man, you've got to come see this guy. He told me all things ever I did. This is the Christ. Come on out and see. And they listened to her. And out they came. And the Bible says many believed because of her. Say, so, Oh man, she was, she was married and divorced five times. God can't use her. You tell God that. You know what I found out over 35 years of preaching? God can use anybody He wants. He can use anybody He wants. I'm not looking to disqualify people. I'm just looking to qualify people. Just, just serve God. She went out and brought her town to Christ. That love God gives you in your heart when you get saved is a love to your fellow man. To want to reach them with the gospel. It's a, it's a passion that, that God gives you. Nobody who is saved, nobody who truly has God's salvation is willing to go to heaven alone. Nobody who truly has God's salvation ever utters the words when someone asks them if they're saved, they never utter the words, that's a private matter. Because it isn't. It's a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. Why? Because we're commanded to go and preach the gospel. To who? Every creature. Every single person needs the gospel. We talked about it with the women this morning. Whether it's a Mary Magdalene, that said, seven devils have been cast out, or whether it's uh, uh, Joanna who sits in the palace of Herod. It doesn't matter who it is, they need the gospel. And it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's someone who's down on the street tonight or living in a tent in the woods tonight, or whether it's the man who occupies the White House tonight. They all need Jesus Christ. They all need Jesus Christ. So we have to love. And the way to love them is give them what they need. And they need Jesus Christ. And so we love our fellow man by giving them the gospel. We love our enemies. We love our fellow man. Then I want to dwell a little bit on this third one. 
And that is we have to love our fellow believers. The a preacher was speaking to a Sunday school class and was telling them things money can't buy. And he said, I want you all to know, boys and girls, that money can't buy you love. Should be a song. Huh? To illustrate the point, the pastor said, what if I offered you $1,000 to not love your mother or father? And there was a quiet hush that came over the room. Until one little boy in the back said, how much will you give me not to love my sister? <laughs> Smart little boy, huh? But we have to love our fellow believers. You think you wouldn't have to even talk about that. You think that would just be a natural thing. Well, man, if I'm going to love my enemies and I'm going to love my fellow man who I'm on earth with, certainly I would love other believers. But sadly, that's not always the case. And by the way, it's not, it's not new in our generation. Turn over to the book of Galatians with me. Will you please? Galatians chapter 5. This was a situation that Paul dealt with here in the churches of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5. And, and here again, <laughs> notice... He says it, let's back all the way up to verse 13 of Galatians 5. Would you look there? For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, here it is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk, take repeated steps in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's interesting. You never Usually we don't put verse 16 with verse 15. But that, Paul is saying when you bite and devour, bite and devour one another, and I don't think he's means that physically, but I sure have seen that take place with the tongue. And he says when you have a lack of love or you're outright hostile and you're trying to backbite and devour another believer, you are in the lust of the flesh. You are not in the Spirit. In fact, the preferred method of damage among most believers is the tongue. More damage has been caused by a wagging tongue than any other weapon forged against the work of God. James talks about the power of the tongue, doesn't he? James chapter 3. Look at James 3 with me. You're in Galatians. Just turn to your right a few more books. And go back after Hebrews is the book of James. James chapter 3. Notice what God has James say about the tongue. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 6. James 3 and verse 6. The Bible says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Wow. That's the tongue. And God says it's an unruly evil. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have blessing and cursing coming out of the same mouth. And let me, let me help you. When you are on social media and you respond to anything with OMG, you're, that's cursing coming out of your mouth. To be careful about what 
you, you, you succumb to in the ways of the world. But be careful about, and, and by the way, you're not going to control your tongue. The Spirit of God must control your tongue. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. I want you to think about this. He said, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We don't hear much about that verse, but that's probably one of the most frightening verses in the Bible. Did he really say every idle word that men shall speak, they'll give account thereof in the day of judgment? I sure wish he hadn't said every idle word. I, I better start asking God to forgive me every day for idle words I say. That's a powerful, powerful verse. Now, if he just says that about idle words, I wonder what he thinks about gossiping words or slandering words. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 6 with me. Would you turn there, please? Proverbs chapter 6. We're talking about now loving fellow believers. Proverbs chapter 6, please. Are you okay? Everybody all right? Proverbs 6. Still glad you came to church tonight? Okay. Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among who? Brethren. That's fellow believers. The discord is, is pretty simple. It's just a, an opposite of unity. When you say something, it doesn't say it's a lie. But it sows discord. It tears people apart instead of brings them together. If I'm going to say something that tears somebody apart, then I better not say it. Because I'll sow discord. And it doesn't need to be said. Satan loves it when there's discord among Christians. He loves that. Because... Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. Cannot stand. We maintain unity. God's for unity among believers. And we do that by building one another up, not tearing others down. You're familiar with Ephesians 4 and verse 32 where it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Okay, but that which is good to the use of edifying. What does edify mean? Yeah, that which builds people up. So in other words, the opposite of edifying is corrupt communication. That's the contrast there. No corrupt communication, but that which is good to the use of edifying. So if what I'm saying is not going to edify, if it's not going to build somebody up, then it's tearing them down. It's corrupt communication, God calls it. Wow. That's why. Look at Ephesians 4 with me, please. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Paul gives some instruction here to the church at Ephesus. And by the way, the church at Ephesus was a good church. You read about them in the book of Revelation. They were good until they left their first love, if you remember. But an excellent church and and he gives some instruction here to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4. Notice verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy 
of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Why would you walk in lowliness and meekness and long suffering and forbearance? Because, verse 3, you're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If you don't walk in lowliness and meekness and long suffering and forbearance, you won't keep the unity of the Spirit. You see, that's that. And, and by the way, when you think about meekness and long suffering and love, those are all fruit of the Spirit. All fruit of the Spirit. Living a Spirit filled life. And that is simply yielding to the Spirit of God, allowing Him to live through you. That's not, that's not a suggestion. That's not something that would be nice if you would do it. It's what God commands. It's what He expects out of believers. You and me. You know, oftentimes that's why He continued to often tell the church to be of one mind. In Romans 12, be of one mind, one to another. Be not wise in your own conceits. Romans 15, 6, he said, Ye may be of one mind and with ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 2.2, 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 1 Peter 3.8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. You say, well, preacher, I, I love so-and-so, I just can't stand them. You know, can I tell you, that won't cut it with God. That won't cut it with God. Don't, don't look to your own understanding and your own selfish feelings. You see, if I'm yielding to how I feel about somebody, then I'm not loving the Lord with all my heart, with all my emotions. I'm, I'm not yielding my emotion to His emotions. We're commanded to love one another. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples if ye have love one to another. He told that to a group of twelve as we've been studying on Wednesday nights that were quite a, quite a different group of guys. You'd have never put these twelve together and said, Okay, we're a team, man. Okay? Uh, it wouldn't have happened that way. Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. 1 John 3.23, that we should believe on the name. This is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Again, there's nothing here about focusing on ourselves. There's nothing, see you say, well when, well, I, I need some me time. Can you tell me where that is in the Bible? You see, that's, that's right up there with the bucket list. Where is that in the Bible? I've yet to hear anybody's bucket list where it's, I'd like to lead so many souls to Christ before I die. I'd like to preach this before I die. I'd like to reach so and so. I'd like to uh, read the Bible through this many more times before I die. There's never anything spiritual on that list. Because that list didn't come from the Bible, that came from the world. Oh, that's quiet. Maybe I should pull over and park there a while. We get. When we talk about being conformed to the world, we, we like. The smoking, the drinking, and all that stuff, the cussing. We don't like it when it gets down to we conform to the world and the way we think and the expressions we use. 
How you doing today? Well, I'm on this side of the dirt. Really? Is that what a Christian says? Would you really rather be here than heaven? I mean, I understand. Like Paul, I'm in a straight betwixt two. You understand? You're like, it's okay to want to, want to live and be here. But I tell you what, nobody who, the first second someone's in heaven, they would never come back here. Ever. The reason we don't love our enemies is because we're loving ourselves. You know why we don't love our fellow man and we get the gospel to them? Because we're too concerned about ourselves. You know what happens when we don't love each other, other believers, and we have discord and, and, and problems? You know why? Because we're looking at ourselves. One preacher said, I found myself with too many commitments in too few days. I was very nervous and tense about it, and I was snapping at my wife and my children, choking down my food at mealtime and feeling irritated at Unexpected interruptions throughout the day. You ever been there? Before long, things at our home, he said, started reflecting the pattern of my hurry-up style. It became almost unbearable. He said, until one evening, I distinctly remember after supper, the words of our youngest daughter. She wanted to tell me something important that had happened to her at school that day, and she began hurriedly, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell you really fast. And I said, honey, you can tell me. You don't have to tell me really fast. Say it slowly. And then he said, I'll never forget her answer. She said, then, Daddy, you'll have to listen slowly. When's the last time you just listened slowly to somebody? You know what most of, most of us do when someone else is talking? We're thinking about what we're going to say next. And we don't listen slowly. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Be eager to hear. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Two, two ears, one mouth. Okay, Listen twice as much as what you speak. God made it real simple for us. We're to love one another. By love, serve one another. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. You see, the Bible makes it pretty clear you can't hate a brother and love God. 1 John 4 and verse 7 and 8, Brethren, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's why you understand. Someone who doesn't know God, they say, oh, I'm in love. They really don't understand what love is. Not, not the way God is. Not the way God loves. If you have a problem with a brother or sister, now let me, let me help you with something. We have a big day coming up. And nothing the devil would like more than to cause a problem between fellow believers. And cause a, a discord. Now, let me, let me help you. Whatever it is over the next seven days or six days that gets you upset or gets you irritated, I want you to just get alone, write it on a piece of paper, and say, I'm going to look at this on Sunday, May 20th, and see if I'm still upset about it. Because you'll probably look at it and say, crumple it up and throw it away. It didn't mean anything. There's, there's, 
the devil will try to oppose what will take place next Saturday. He will, there will be pushback. And his favorite place to attack is through people. Oh, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We know who's behind it. So understand when someone says something or somebody does something and you get irritated, what do you do that for? I thought so-and-so was going to do that. How come they didn't do that? Well, what's this doing? Isn't someone supposed to be there? How come no one's there? See? And right away we can get all upset. And the problem is then we don't just keep that to ourselves. We go to someone else. Well, you know, I was over there and, you know, they weren't there, Chuck. You know, someone, so-and-so, they're supposed to be there. That Quentin, I don't know what happened to him. And before you know it, you know what we're doing? Sowing discord. And Satan is happy. So so be aware. We're not ignorant of his devices. Okay? Let's make sure that we're loving one another. You know, the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sins. I imagine it might cover some faults too, don't you think? That's what love does. Pray for one another. Consider one another. Be kind one to another. Hmm. It all comes down to this. You know what? None of us are worthy of anything God's given us. I'm not worthy to be a pastor. If you think you're worthy, you need to use the altar tonight. We're not worthy. There's only one who's worthy. And that's the Lord Jesus. Revelation 5, when we get to heaven, you know what we're going to sing? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory and the honor and the blessing and the praise. It's all Him. This coming week and this Saturday, and our Christian life isn't about us. It is about Him. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. But we love our foes, we love our fellow man, and we love our fellow believers. That's loving others as the Lord wants us to. I have to understand this. Why is that important? Because here it works the other way. If we we understand if we don't love God, we're not going to love one another. Here's the secret to this. If people who arrive on this property Saturday, if they don't like us, they won't listen to our Christ. They have to like us. And the way that we can get them to like us is we love them. What do you, why, do, why do you do that? You, you know, this, and, and you've given wonderful offerings, but, you know, I, I told Bob, I... I, you say, how much do we spend on the country fair, or on the, you know, the fun fest now, the country fair? You just call it, you know what? I don't even want to know. I kind of close my eyes and <laughs> say, Lord, please supply for these needs and supply for this. But it's a big investment. Don't anybody, uh, we had one fellow years ago who got upset. In fact, he, he left our church because he felt like we, We don't do enough to reach the community. All we do is foreign missions. He had no idea. Should see what goes into having a day like like Saturday. Try try providing food and games and prizes and drinks and cotton candy and everything for a thousand people and don't ask anything from anybody. Because we want to tell them we love you. And we have a Savior that wants to, we'd like to introduce you to. We want you to know who Jesus is. Maybe if, they, if they'll, like us, they'll listen to us talk to them about Jesus Christ. But we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Love Him with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. Then we'll love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the, that's, the second greatest commandment. 
We have a great opportunity this week, church. Love others. Folks can come, and I want them to have a good time. I want them to enjoy the day. But I'd like them to walk away from Saturday and at least say, you know what, those people there, they love you. They love you. That's, that's, the, that's the goal. And let's, let's ask God to help us to show them that this coming Saturday. And be aware that some will be foes, some will be fellow men, some will be fellow believers, but let's love them all the same. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this second great commandment that, Lord, we confess we cannot do without you. We cannot do without yielding to the Spirit of God in our life. And, Lord, I'm asking tonight, I guess, as we look at these next six days in preparation for the fun fest, the big carnival day on Saturday where we're inviting just thousands of people to come. The opportunity to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. To tell them how much you love them. That you sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross for their sins. That they could have eternal life they could have forgiveness of sin. I pray, Lord, that they would watch us in action on Saturday and they would say, these people love one another. These people love me. These people love God. And put a desire in their heart, God, to want to love you as well. We are trusting you to work in our hearts so you could work through us on Saturday to be a blessing and a help to our community.